Welcome to Because the Beatles, the podcast about the Beatles, everything about the Beatles, 24-8. I'm Erica. And I'm Allison. We've been away for a week or so, more than we wanted to be, because Allison was at the amazing Fest for Beatles fans in Chicago. Yep, yep. Lots to come about that later. This was probably one of the more fun Fest for Beatles fans, and we'll talk more about the actual fest if you're not really familiar with it also. But before we start, make sure to subscribe to Because the Beatles, BC the Beatles on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. And while we're on the subject, thank you to all the fest goers who were so enthusiastic about this podcast while Allison was there. So welcome to all of you. Yes, thank you so much to all of you guys who picked up flyers or buttons. So hopefully you guys are listening in. And uh, yeah, like Erica said, welcome to the welcome to the madness, as it were. <laughs> and also we want to shout out to another amazing Beatles podcast. Personally, one of my favorites ever. It's called Screw It. We're just going to talk about the Beatles. Um, it's so hosted, good. It's so good. Hosted by Will Hines, who's an Upright Citizens Brigade comedian and teacher and an actor and a director and a writer. And he and his very, very very funny friends come together and talk about the Beatles and on their last episode which was what they call an unsolicited yeah. commentary track to the movie Help which is hilarious um, yeah. they mentioned us as a new podcast to listen to so thank you for doing that we love you so guys amazing. too and yes. welcome to everybody who's coming here from Screw It if you like Screw It I think you'll like us too so stick around if you do like this podcast feel free to leave us a review um, give us a rating five stars is preferable just saying um but your review and rating will definitely help other beetle maniacs find us yes and follow us on facebook instagram and twitter our handle is bc the beatles everywhere and we'll be posting videos photos and more from this episode and beyond totally let's kick things off with a little bit of beatles history so August 15th, 1962, Ringo joined the Beatles, and the puzzle is complete, I guess you could say. Yeah. Ringo joined because Pete Best got fired. Pete Best mm -hmm. was their drummer for about two years, I think, before before Ringo started, maybe a year and a half. Yeah, he joined just before they went to Hamburg, because literally they just needed a drummer, and Pete, number one, had a kit, and number two, was not already in a band. Because most drummers in Liverpool were already otherwise occupied but pete best he was available so the beatles were like all right dude let's go to amberg i think they could only have gone actually if they found a drummer i think they already knew of him through his mother mona best who was kind of a small time club promoter in liverpool and right. um Asba club yeah they knew of pete best she knew that they knew that he had a kit and he auditioned and there you go he was actually very popular with the fans. He was really attractive. He had this like Elvis sort of pompadour. His nickname was Mean, Moody, and Magnificent Pete Best. So the girls really went crazy for him. Yeah. One problem was that his beat wasn't amazing. And we'll talk about that in a second, detailing the reasons why Pete was fired, because that's a really controversial issue, obviously, with the Beatles. Pete says a lot of different things, and a lot of the Beatles say a lot of different things, and, you know, people over the years have changed the story. But, you know, his good looks obviously were rumored to be part of the reason he was let go, because Paul and George especially were upset that all the girls, like Pete. I don't totally yeah. believe that would be the reason they get rid of him people liked Stu too he was charming and mysterious and gorgeous Stu was really hot yeah he was yeah. like a hot artist like yeah he was like mysterious and yeah he also super, couldn't play the bass so he wore sunglasses and turned his back to the audience <laughs> you don't <laughs> need to play the bass when you look like Stuart Sutcliffe I'm just saying so Pete to go into the firing just a little bit so there are a few reasons so number one his looks that was a rumor what some historians believe this is probably the most plausible reason is because he, like you said, Erica, he really couldn't keep a beat. He wasn't that great on the drums. And that was recognized by none other than George Martin uh, when the Beatles came in to do uh, Love Me Do for the first session. And he was like, you know, this guy cannot play the drums. You can have him for your live shows, but he's not going to play on your records. I'm I'm going to hire a session drummer if you keep him. And in fact, you know, neither Pete nor Ringo played on Love Me Do. And Ringo was pissed about it for years and years. He probably still is, honestly. He's probably still bitter as fuck. Probably. I would be too. I first day with the Beatles. I'm awesome. I'm coming in and the producer's like, nope. 
Sorry. <laughs> exactly. I think I read too that like Ringo and George, like had, that was like their running joke forever where, uh, you know, Ringo was like, well, you wouldn't let me play the drums, George, you know, and he'd sort of rib him about that for the rest of the Beatles recording career. Yeah, I think it was a little bit more than a joke on Ringo's part. Well, you know, all jokes come from a place of like bitterness, right? That's right. true. Right. <laughs> no, well, no, that's probably as you, but it's also generally true. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So anyway, so that was pro- that's probably, to me, it seems like the most plausible. But he was also just honestly, like, a, he didn't fit in. He wouldn't get their haircut, um, you know, the beetle cut. He didn't get the humor, which is crazy to me, as, like, you know, Liverpudlians all have this fantastic sense of humor. But I guess Pete Best was, like, the one that didn't get the gene. He just wasn't meshing well with them. He wouldn't really even hang out with them. Yeah. So like when they were in Hamburg, the three of them would go out for a pint after whatever they were doing. They'd hang out. Pete would just go off and explore. He would take pictures. He would just be by himself. He did not want to meld with the group. It just didn't work. But one of the weird reasons that Pete was fired came from Neil Aspinall, who I always forget this fact, but Neil Aspinall had an affair with Mona Best. So Neil had lived with the best for a hot second and he and Mona sort of started shacking up. And Neil is the father of Pete's brother, Rogue, who Rogue is, if you remember back to, I think our last episode, we talked about the new Beatles museum going up on Matthew Street. Rogue is really the proprietor of that. And he also runs um, the Casbah Club tours in Liverpool. And he has a lot to do with Pete's legacy as well. And, and Neil was really upset and worried that he got Pete fired because he it was, you know, Mona Best's baby daddy. But that's not true. I think Neil was just sort of like covering his ass. And I don't think anybody would have cared. That's true. And, you know, it's funny because uh, I read an account where Neil Aspen also that he took Pete up to the Grapes pub after Pete was fired by Brian. And he was like, you know, Pete, should I quit? I, you know, in solidarity with you. And, and Pete was like, no, like the Beatles are going to be famous. Stick with them. And it's like, yeah, OK. I don't know if that conversation actually happened, but. That know, makes so. Pete sound very noble. Yeah. Uh, at that time when I just I cannot believe that that's how he would feel and you know he really did have a hard time you know very sadly he tried to kill himself a few years later he yeah. didn't succeed thankfully and I don't think he tried that again but you know it really did have a terrible toll on him yeah absolutely and you know shout out honestly to Pete Best because like he is called so many like you know the unluckiest man in music just a footnote in Beatles history and he has come out on the other side I saw him, I don't know, 10 years ago do his Pete Best band thing, and it was pretty good. And he was touring with some, like, young guys from Liverpool who were really, really good. That would be so impossible to bounce back from, you know, and good for him for sticking with it and and surviving. I think that he's going to get a little bit of redemption, too, through his brother, Rogue Best Museum. If you look at the front of the museum, have you seen the pictures of this? I haven't yet. Okay, so if you look look at it... it They made these really nice artistic pictures of the Beatles and their names are are there, you know, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And they're sort of in the internal area of the entrance. But on the outside of it, the first names you actually see are Pete and Stuart and their faces. So he's really trying to put Pete's history back into the Beatles, posting pictures of, you know, you come to my museum, you never know when you're going to meet a Beatle. And he's posting pictures of Pete hanging out with some fans. So maybe we'll learn more about this history as we start to hear a bit more about Pete's side through his brother's efforts. I want to go so bad. We need to plan. We say this every episode, but we need to plan a trip to Liverpool again but anyway, so so the actual firing, I don't know. It's not st- as straightforward as it could be, but did Brian fire him? I think that's a yes. Um, and were the other Beatles behind it? I think that's probably also a yes. Yeah. You know, you could make the argument of Brian didn't think he fit in, but it was obvious that the Beatles were just like, we don't want Pete, um, you know, and... And as a result, like we were just saying, you know, Pete says he hasn't spoken to Paul or Ringo, or I don't think he spoke to John or George since he was fired. They did play a show, I think, a few weeks after the firing. And they, I've, I read that it was sort of cordial, but they didn't really talk backstage. Um, you know, Pete was playing with another band at that time. So R.I.P. Pete Best in the Beatles. But obviously, then we have... We have Ringo joining. A little bit about Ringo's past. Ringo was actually one of the most popular and sought after drummers on the Mersey Beat music scene. 
He was part of a band called Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. He had all these rings. He was very eccentric. That, you know, that name Ringo was well before he ever joined the Beatles. And he had even a section when he was, he was the drummer there called Star Time. He would sing a song, so he'd be in the back bashing away with his head shaking, you know, screaming out boys or one of the songs that he liked to do, which was, you know, some of the things that carried over into the Beatles. He was somebody they wanted. He was somebody they knew about. They chose him. It wasn't actually the same as it was with Pete, where they're like, we need a drummer who has a drum kit or else we can't do this gig. So, hey, this guy's going to do it. They wanted Ringo. As soon as they were able to put the firing in motion, they actually went to go find Ringo. He was playing with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes at one of those countryside holiday camps for a summer gig. I think it was Paul and George actually drove down to the the holiday camp where they were and just knocked on the door and be like, we want you to join the Beatles now. <laughs> Come with us. Get yeah, in the car. Basically. Get in the car, loser. We're going shopping. <laughs> it's, it was just like Mean Girls, I'm guessing. Probably. Except Ringo was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, hold out for a little while and like not, not, um, you know, be a dick to my buddies in the Hurricanes. But he did obviously join the Beatles very soon after <laughs> and the rest was history. And yeah, Roy Storm, the Hurricanes had a, middling success in the Merseyside scene for a while, but they did not make it in the same way, of course, that uh, many of the Beatles or even some of the other bands managed by Brian did. I wonder who would have been the drummer had Ringo been like, nope, I'm going to stay with my pal Rory and this band I'm playing with. Like, I wonder who they would have approached after that. Yeah, I don't really know, because before Pete, they went through drummer after drummer after drummer. I mean, it was just... It was ridiculous how many people they had. This guy, Tommy Moore, who was like way older than them. And, you know, he he was with that. He was working and married and he kind of had to go because his his wife couldn't take it anymore that he was he was drumming. Like they went through all of these session guys. They probably would have had to use one of the session guys that that George Martin chose until they found the right fourth. It probably would have been like a John Paul George situation with the rotating drummer or something. I don't know. I mean, that would boil down to like how integral is Ringo into the final formula of the Beatles. I will concede. I don't think there would be a Beatles, obviously as we know it without, without Ringo, just based on not really his abilities, but, but his, you know, his panache and his sort of like presence. I think that added a lot, obviously to not only the Beatles films, because he was the star of pretty much all of them, but also just sort of like his presence and his name, you know, instantly recognizable John Paul George it's like how many of those are there in the world a thousand million trillion but and Ringo there's only, there's only one Ringo I disagree a bit with the assessment of his drumming I think that <laughs> <laughs> actually being here we go yeah we do have a bit of a difference of opinion about about Ringo mm-hmm. I'll just say Ringo was a left-handed drummer actually which was fairly rare and because of that and because he was basically self-taught he had a very different style than most of the people who drummed in the music scene. He he was recognizable for that. And and really, you know, in those days, the drummer just kept a decent beat. But Ringo kept a unique beat. And the beat that he kept worked really well with the kind of music that John and Paul and later George were writing. So whether his style was technically proficient or great, whatever it was, it clicked with what they needed. So he fit. He was that fourth piece that just made it all click. And once Ringo joined, they became this unbreakable foursome. You know, John, Paul, and George were a unit, but Pete, he was an outsider. But as soon as Ringo joined, Ringo was a fellow Beatle. He had the same Liverpudlian sense of humor. They wanted to be together. I mean, they shared the hotel rooms. They went on vacation together when they really didn't have to, even at the height of Beatlemania. They had a bond that made the Beatles greater than what they were before with Pete, even though Pete did add a lot to, you know, the Beatles' overall image. And as far as image is concerned, he played a key role in the Beatles' image, you know. He filled that fourth personality type, that self-deprecating, smaller than everybody else, a natural comic, you know. He allowed people to sort of bust his balls about his nose and (laughs) make fun of him and everything. And he endeared himself to the band, and I think he endeared himself to a lot of fans, especially American girls, loved, loved Ringo. And I can appreciate all of that. Now, I'm going to confess something, and I can't believe it's taken us 
to episode three to get into this whole thing. But something that um, looms large in my Beatles legend is that mm. I don't really like Ringo. So I'm going to throw that out there mm-hmm. and I'll we'll go into it more. Probably need to have a separate time and a place for this. But I can appreciate everything you just said. And I think that's true. I don't put him on the same level as John Paul or George. I think that there's a saying, you know, that floats around that, you know, Ringo wasn't even the best drummer in the Beatles. Uh, I mean, that's got some basis in truth. I think he was good for exactly what they needed. Was he like prolific? I don't think so. I think he had some shining moments. People point to like rain and obviously the solo on, you know, the sweet Navy road, but like, I don't see him as, intrinsic to the value of the Beatles as a musical force. But like, I think the beauty of Ringo is that he was able to like, sort of just lay back and be that for the Beatles so that John and Paul could write the songs and create. And George could also, you know, try to get his songs in the albums, uh, you know, and, and work on his, his own musical development. I think Ringo sort of held it down as it were, but I don't know. I don't see him as instrumental, no pun intended, mm. um, to the Beatles, their music. I just don't. I don't think they needed a fourth genius. I think right. if they had another person like that, they would have exploded with the egos. Yeah, They, they exactly. wouldn't have been able to do it. Ringo was able to be in the back. And in his way, he was certainly an innovator. Being left-handed, being self-taught, he had his own unique style He invented, just like the other Beatles did, some creative methods to achieve unusual effects as the Beatles' music evolved. So he did do that. His drum sound is is instantly recognizable, I would think. Many drummers have said it's almost impossible to actually replicate. I think even Abe Laboreal Jr., who's been drumming with Paul McCartney for way longer than the Beatles have ever been together, has said that even. I think that's generous. I mean, I think that's a little bit of lip service to Ringo. I don't know if I believe it. Very honestly, <laughs> I think Abe is being very, very kind to Ringo by saying that. I mean, maybe it comes from virtue of like, if you're not naturally left handed, you're going to have a different technique, you're going to hold the sticks differently, or you know, whatever Ringo did, just his own personal drumming style that it's hard to replicate. But I don't think technically what he did, I don't think that's impossible. Like, and I'm not a drummer, so don't at me if you are, but but let me just clarify all this. So, like, none of what I just said is the reason I hate Ringo. Uh, I, I mean, the reason I don't like Ringo. Keeping <laughs> uh, that in. I, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should just have an episode called This Problem with Ringo, and then we'll just, like, fight the whole time. And anyway, should we move on? <laughs> okay, let's move on. Let's move on. Welcome, move on. Ringo. Thank you for your contributions. And Pete Best, we can't wait to learn more about you in your brother's museum. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ringo, for your service. (laughs) Obviously, this has been a really busy period because of Paul. And we'll get to Paul's newest tracks that he's releasing and Paul's shenanigans he's been getting up to. Uh, But first... The internet pretty much exploded. I had people like tagging me in this post who don't like the Beatles, don't know anything about the Beatles, but they knew I would get a kick out of it. So they were tagging me in posts about the selfie that James McCartney and Sean Lennon took together. And it's lovely because Sean posted a picture not too long ago with Danny as well. It's just really cute that they all keep up sort of with each other and they have this sort of bond but the big buzz around the photo was the fact that I think James in it is holding a guitar. Yep. So everybody's like, is, are, they making, are they making music together? Oh my gosh. But I don't think we should hold our breath. I don't think anything is going to really come of that. I think they're probably just like hanging out and jamming as friends do. Probably. Uh, Sean's on his own trip with his music. And, and James, uh, I'm not sure if he's working on a new album, but he just finished, I think, another tour not long ago. But they're probably just, you know, their paths cross. And that's nice that they got to chill out with each other. Personally, I'd probably rather die than be one of the two sons of two Beatles trying to make music together. The comparisons would be horrific. Even if they're great in their own right, they would never be able to live it down. So I have a feeling there's never going to be like a a baby Beatle reunion type of thing going on. But it is really nice to see that they're friends. Yeah. And they look very happy to be in each other's company. Absolutely. Sean, James, Danny, share more pictures. We'd love to see you guys hanging out. And we really enjoy seeing the resemblances to your fathers. It's really weird. James is like the perfect hybrid of his parents. Yeah. Like he's got Linda's, you know, beautiful, like, strawberry blonde hair. and, and But his face is, like, 
carbon copy Paul. It's mm-hmm. insane. And really, Sean looks Sean, so yeah. much like John. It's trippy. And Danny, of course. Danny's like a, t- a clone. I sometimes see pictures of Danny and I'm like, where? how have I missed this picture of George like over the years? And it's like, nope, that's Danny. The next news item is unfortunately very sad, but that mm-hmm. we all know that the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, died this week. So sad. She was really a gift to music that nobody can ever replicate. But we just wanted to call out how much of a connection Aretha Franklin had to the Beatles. There's an article in Rolling Stone this week called Why Nobody Sang the Beatles Like Aretha. And it's amazing. It goes through many of the songs that she actually recorded. Eleanor Rigby was one of them. Long and Winding Road and Let It Be was actually written with Aretha in mind. Paul was thinking of her when he wrote that, which is why you can really hear that, that gospel sort of feel behind it is because he had her in mind. Yeah, and he sent her, you know, a demo of it before the Beatles released it. And she actually released her version first, but of course the Beatles overshadowed Aretha's. But yeah, it's amazing. And my favorite thing about her cover from Eleanor Rigby is that she took it and made it a first person. So she's singing yeah. as Eleanor Rigby, which is amazing. You know, you wouldn't necessarily have thought of that song and, and that artist together, but it's brilliant. She could take anything and put her own spin on it. And it's just, she was such a prolific, amazing like versatile artists in a way that not many people are. It's just, it's so sad. You know, she'd been sick for so long and hopefully she's, you know, in a better place and yeah. resting comfortably. But, you know, it's a huge, massive, tragic loss. It's just so sad. So sad. And we'll be sharing some of these recordings of her, her Beatles covers yeah. throughout the week because they're just so good. And, and anybody who knows Aretha for her big hits who hasn't heard these, it's another side of her and it just, it's beautiful. It melds the Beatles so well in with her style and you got to hear it. It's just yeah, great. exactly. Exactly. On a little bit of a lighter note, actually a really light note. This is hilarious. So some math nerds <laughs> got together um, and decided to figure out who actually wrote in my life using math. You know, but we all know who wrote in my life. Yeah, of course, it's going to be John. Like, Paul has said over the years, he's tried to, like, take credit for it. But come on, Paul. Like, Which is weird. Can... I don't know why he even bothers. Yeah, it's, it's so like not wrong. even. It's so John. It's, like, ridiculously John. And Paul's wrong. I'm I'm sorry, Paul. Like, I know you listen to this podcast religiously, but you're super wrong. Yeah. Don't at me. Actually, but... please at us. If you're Paul McCartney and you're listening to this, <laughs> yeah, yeah sure. I want to hear from you. So, yeah, they came up with a formula using different criteria from songs were based on like number of words used, like how, how many times a certain word appeared in songs and like musical elements as well. And to sort of determine who actually wrote that. I wonder like why they chose that song in particular. Like that's not even a debated song. I really think he chose this one because it's one where everybody is intuitively sure that it's John, but Paul has said that he wrote some of it. So I think they just wanted to see if there was any truth to what Paul said, and there's, there's not. We knew that instinctually, but, you know, thank you, Math, for proving that it's actually true. Yeah, thanks, nerds. Thanks. If you enjoy this, these guys also were the people who deconstructed the opening chord on a hard day's night, Professor and Beatles fan Jason Brown. If that's your geekdom, go for it. Another piece of news which has come up time and time again is once again... John Lennon's killer, Mark David Chapman, is up for parole. God, (laughs) when can we stop caring about him? This is the 10th attempt to be released. You know what I was surprised about? I guess I never paid attention and knew that his original sentence was only 20 to life. Like, what the frig? Like, honestly, like, I feel like people get sentenced to death or life in prison for, like, so much less now. And he literally murdered somebody in cold blood, had a really fucked up reason behind it. And he only got 20 to life. Like, that's the reason why he comes up for, for parole every two seconds. Like, yeah, ugh. but he'll never get it. And you know what? That's kind yeah, of his won't. punishment. He's always going to have the hope that he's going to get out. And that fucker is never going to get out. That's true. Never. And, you know, theoretically, if he did, he steps out of that prison. Some Beatles fans going to shoot him immediately. Yeah, yep, exactly. So, you know what? MDC, you stay locked up. You stay right where you are. And we won't dedicate more time to you on this podcast. Because nope. you are a piece of shit. You suck. Bye bye. And to bring it back to awesome stuff, we should just call this segment This Week in Paul because he's doing stuff all the time. We're a little late to the folks. We missed an episode. But, you know, Paul was at the cavern. Very exciting. Really cool to see him back, you know, in Liverpool. He obviously played the Philharmonic Bar for Corden. And so excited. I think on 
Monday, there's going to be an extended version of Carpool Karaoke with maybe more of the pub show. I kind of hope it doesn't because the pub show for me was kind of the most boring part of Carpool Karaoke. But yeah, I, think... I want to see more about the two of them in Liverpool. That was Yeah, fun. I want to see Paul tooling around Liverpool. I can't wait to watch it. I'm excited. Me too. For sure. And while we're on the subject of small gigs, let's hope he does more small gigs. Oh my God, please. If he played a small gig near me, I would sleep outside for days to get those tickets. I did that. I did that when he played Highland Ballroom in 2007 when I was living in New York and it was worth it. Worth it. I wish that I wouldn't do it again, but I would probably do it again. Of course you would do it again. And you had a good theory about... I don't know if you want to name the name of the venue that you kind of think he's going to play in Brooklyn. My money would be on Rough Trade New York City, which is in Brooklyn, only because they tweeted this huge mural of Egypt Station. I'm not even sure why they put it up, but they put it up. It's gigantic. Paul McCartney actually liked that tweet. Paul McCartney's MPL account does not randomly go through the internet and like tweets. Rough Trade is a London-based company they have done things with other british artists before i think last year liam gallagher was over there he played a secret show he did a record signing he did that kind of stuff at the same venue so i am thinking that they have a kind of relationship and if you're in the new york city area rough trade is a place you might want to you know just hone your radar in a little bit on maybe start following their socials just just in case I agree. And I'm trying to think for myself because I live in Los Angeles where he might play here. But I know he's done Amoeba. Yeah. And then he put out that like sort of pseudo bootleg Amoeba secret. I don't know if he'd do Amoeba again, though. I don't. Maybe if he's doing record stores. I would love it if he did Hmm. that. He's played at the Cavern. That's a historic pub. It's not like he's just going to show up in random bars. So I feel like if he's going to do something like this, it's going to be coordinated with somebody, some other entity. I think it's either going to be at one of those smaller venues like, you know, in New York, I would think like a knitting factory or St. Anne's Warehouse or something like that. And I'm sure there's right. many in L.A. and other, other cities. Hopefully. Hopefully he does. I mean, before he, he heads out on his uh, amazingly named Freshen Up Tour. I still <laughs> hate that so much. I hate it too. <laughs> but if it means he's freshening up the set list and he's freshening up yes. his venue choices, oh, okay, please. I'll, I'll keep it. And you know what? Please, if, Jesus. If you look at the um, the set list from this Cavern Club thing, it was many of his usual things. But it was also yeah. some new stuff. He did three or four new songs. He did Martha, My Dear. He did Rocky Raccoon. So he's doing some other Beatles songs he doesn't really do in concert right now. Yeah, it sounds like some White Album tribute. Speaking of songs that he'll probably play in concert, he dropped his latest single, uh, a couple days ago, uh, called Fuh You. And I really thought this was going to, because there's a rumor that there's a track on the new album that's like anti-Trump. And I yeah. was hoping this would be it. Because that would be amazing be to be too. like, Fuh You. But that's not how Fuh You is used in a song. No, um, it's it's more and, about straight up yeah. sex. If that's yeah. how you're well, reading yeah. it. It's got a yeah, double meaning. How, yeah. Because Ryan Tedder on Instagram, who produced it, and obviously Ryan Tedder is a major, major songwriter, he sort of glossed over it with, no, but it's the actual lyric is, I just want it for you. But of course, Paul and his accent, it sounded like, fa you. He said they both love that, you know, the double entendre of it. But it's like, I don't hear that at all. The, I just want it for you. I just hear, I just want to fa you. Yeah. And that's fine, because that's hysterical. But it's also like, oh, Jesus, Paul, like the first time I heard it, (laughs) it was like, you're embarrassing us. At first, yeah, but then (laughs) it kind of, it really grew on me. Like as far as the song was concerned, I really, really like it. And I know I'm kind of in the minority. There's been a lot of hate for this song online. I think it's fun. I think people are expecting this album to like change lives and I get it like we've waited a long time for this album to come out and for new Paul in general and what's been put out so far has been a little bit lackluster Mm -hmm. but I'm trying to just enjoy it for what it is like it's new Paul it's fun it's like pretty lighthearted. like this one has a lot of humor in it it's got a lot of like current sort of sounds and arrangements which obviously is pissing off some of the people who already think C is too influenced by Kanye, which is hysterical. Right? That was like three years ago now. I saw some people online saying like, they're just not even going to buy the album because they're so disgusted with what they hear. And this is just like disgusting. It's like, have a sense of humor. My goodness gracious. If you don't like explicit subjects, it's not your thing. Cool. That's fine. But condemning 
the entire album or Paul's modern catalog. I haven't even heard all of the album. I think that's too far. As far as the song itself, the lyrics, especially at the beginning, are pretty pedestrian. And I've noticed that about all three of the songs that have come out. I don't know, actually. It was, the lyrics are pretty good. But the other two were... Yeah. Lyrics have always been second to melody for him. I'll just say that. But... Once it came into the chorus, it was really fun. I thought the title was fun. I thought the subject was fun. I was disappointed that Ryan Tedder had to come out and explain anything at all and justify their choices. Yeah. If you look at the song, though, Ryan Tedder produced... He wrote and produced Halo. He's worked with Adele. He's worked with so many modern artists. Yeah, he's a phenomenal pillar of the songwriting community for the past decade or so, for sure. Paul always likes to stay current on top. So they work together and they put something out that on one hand, if Miley Cyrus released this or if the band Fun released this or Imagine Dragons, if some one of those bands released this song, it would be like one of the summer hits of the year. Like you'd, yeah, for yeah, sure. you'd be out, you'd be drinking a beer, you'd be listening to this on the patio. It would be awesome. But Paul has all of this baggage where it's really difficult for him to get past who people think he is. But, yeah. you know, I have two arguments about that. And, you know, I've been saving all of my anger about the internet backlash for right now. So sorry. Please, um, please. <laughs> let's do this. Yeah. Okay, internet. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you, internet. <laughs> First of all, when people are saying they're embarrassed for him trying to be too young and modern and trying to go with a sound that isn't his sound. Okay, let's say, what do the, all these other songs have in common? Let's start with um, Silly Love Songs, Temporary Secretary, Say Say Say, Press, My Brave Face, Appreciate, the work with Kanye, the thing that he did with Dave Grohl, Cut Me Some Slack. All of those things are examples of Paul being open to different music styles, looking around, seeing what's out there, and wanting to incorporate his style with what was going on. Something we talk about a lot when we talk about Paul and his more modern catalog. It's like he's always been wanting to innovate. He's always been on that front edge. And it's ironic because, you know, John accused him so much of throwing back with his granny shit. But he's always been like wanting to experiment with like electronics and and genre bend in his his songs. It's like this is not surprising. No. So my second beef with everything, actually I have three beefs, not two. My second beef is that if people are annoyed that Paul is talking so much about sex and sexuality, stop. He has always talked about sex and sexuality. Some, you know, less subtle than others, but almost every love song is about sex. In just 17, you know what I mean? That was about sex. Why don't we do it in the road? Might have been about a pair of monkeys, but that was explicitly about sex. Hi, hi, hi got banned for its sweet banana and I'm going to hit you with my putty gun references. So... <laughs> <laughs> when you say the lyrics, it's just hysterical. It's ridiculous. Okay. It's amazing. So, <laughs> so there, there is no question that this dude likes sex. So, I mean, if you're thinking of Paul as, you know, prim, proper, the English tea guy, yes, that's a part of him too, but so is this. So let's have some fun with it. It's awesome. And then building on that, my last major beef with the complaints about this song is that people are weirded out that somebody his age is singing about sex okay maybe you know having sex with an old dude is not your thing but there's absolutely no nothing comment. wrong yeah okay <laughs> paul you're still sexy at 76 you will still be sexy at 86 anyway if that's not your thing that's cool but talking about it like he shouldn't be thinking about this he shouldn't be having sex he shouldn't be using words like this to describe sex well that's ageist i think it's ageist if a younger artist put this out that wouldn't even be a second thought if you really want to be specific about it i mean he had said that it was kind of a song about a memory of being single and meeting somebody because obviously he's not out in the clubs right now he's been married for like yeah, four years that was, and that was my first reaction it wasn't like oh how dare he sing about this but my first reaction was like oh this sounds like a single person singing this you know not like somebody who's been married you know to nancy now for what eight years or something seven years it was an idea of a memory it's a fun throwback why not be able to sing about whatever the hell you want if he loves sex good on you and you know what if you are 76 and you still love sex you should be able to celebrate it That's good for you paul all i'm saying so i really do hope that 
once the initial shock of the song wears off, that people will revisit it and see it for what it's worth. And really, musically, if you look at it, it's not just Paul singing over a Ryan Tedder production. If you listen to the middle, there's a classical vibes in it. So, you know, there's definitely a signature Paul McCartney feel about this song, which makes it even cooler. Is it the masterpiece of his career? No. Is it something to be freaking out about? Absolutely not. It's a fun song. Of the three, it's probably my favorite that I've heard so far from Egypt Station. And you know what? I'm looking forward to hearing the other 12 or so. It's a long album. Yeah, it is. And I don't have the track listing in front of me, but I think it's going to also include a suite. So I'm really excited to hear that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree. I think take it for what it is. It's new Paul. Like that alone, it's that's fine. That's great. Yeah, we should great. feel so lucky that we have Paul McCartney still producing music. You know, if you don't yeah. love it, that's fine. But we shouldn't be this lucky that we still have somebody like that still making new music for us. And not to be morbid, but like I've heard people say, oh, I'm going to skip this one. It's like, well, <laughs> I wouldn't. And yep. I'm not going to go any further. But it's like, I wouldn't skip this one. <laughs> no, let's, let's be grateful for what we've got now because we're yeah. not going to have it forever. Exactly. But we have it and now. It's like, and that's awesome. Yeah, 100% agreed with everything now if you're out there and you want to talk with us about this song i would love to talk to you about it because i want to know more you know this is just my opinion i want to hear your opinion i want to know what's what bothers you about the song what you love about the song i'm i'm really curious because when i first heard it my strong reaction was like oh that's funny so i would love to hear you know have a dialogue about that i think the first time i heard it i texted you like oh my god <laughs> yeah i actually posted that <laughs> on our twitter because oh the tech conversation was too funny for me there is a, a little bit of a throwback. I don't even know if this was meant. A little bit of a, an Easter egg. There was an artist called Stephen Friedland, or Friedland who went by the name Brute Force. And he is probably the person who recorded what must be the rarest single that the Apple music label ever produced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the demo that he submitted, it was a tape that was given to Brian. Um, it was a demo of a song called King of Fa. King of Fa. I wish I could know Brian's reaction or the to reading King. that title. Fa King. <laughs> the Fa King. Oh, I get it. Yes, <laughs> the Fa King. So yes. <laughs> the wordplay tickled George and John so much that they championed this guy to release the single on Apple. Like, George Harrison, like, arranged for strings to be, you know, dubbed over this demo. That's yeah. amazing. I was surprised they didn't, like, steal it and secretly record it. I know, right? It was released in May of 1969, but it never got widespread distribution because the lyrics, you know, offended people. John Lennon was so mad he called the Apple manager at the time, Ken Mansfield, a tight-ass censor. Uh, but, you know, as mad as John was, nobody would touch it. Nobody would sell it. Nobody would play it on the radio. Like, it just it just would not happen. So um, so it never really worked out. But, but now it's kind of getting its moment because people are relating it back to this new single. Yeah. And it's not that, that this guy's gone away. Two years ago at the 2016 Beatle Fest in New York, he actually did a set on the secondary stage of the fest called the Apple Jam stage. He did a sing-along version of King of Fa at the Beatle Fest. I don't think I was at that fest because I don't remember that, but that must have been amazing. I don't think you were at 2016 New York. Yeah, I, I, I was, so but I can't remember this particular thing, unfortunately. I, didn't, I wasn't there to see it, but awesome. You're still out there. Brute Force, may you reign as the King of Fa, and maybe your, your single will get a little bit more notice now that Paul McCartney has kind of brought this out. The King of Fudge just had to wait five decades, half a century. He was a king before his time. Exactly. As Erica just mentioned, the Fest for Beatles fans, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a recap here because it took place, uh, so it takes place twice a year, um, once in New York, typically in the springtime, about March, and once in Chicago, usually the second weekend of August. It's really what the name sounds like. It is a festival for Beatles fans. It's Comic-Con for Beatle nerds. With less cosplay. You would think there'd be more cosplay. I wish there was um, more cosplay. 
I do too. That would be but generally. Amazing. I wish there was more cosplay in life. So yeah, well, that's a that's a general gripe about life. Mm-hmm. Some people call it Beetle Fest. They don't call it Beetle Fest anymore for I think legal reasons. I'm not sure. It used to be called Beetle Fest, and somehow it's now called the much more awkward Fest for Beatles fans. So it's been going on since the 70s. Uh, The story goes that its founder, Mark Lapidos, got personal blessing from John Lennon to have the fest and that the rest is history, really. So Eric and I typically go. My first was the New York Fest in 2013, I believe. What was your first fest? It was two years later, so New York 2015. We typically do panels and uh, talks and the New York Fest in 2018, a few months ago, I actually got to sit down with Jeremy Clyde, interview him. That was a great interview. Did anybody record oh, that? Thanks. I know they broadcasted it live on the Chad and Jeremy Facebook page. You might still be able to find it. If we if we find it, we'll share it. And uh, Jeremy was nice to play a couple songs and answer some questions from the people there. And it was a really intimate space, which I think was the best part. Mm-hmm. But I just want to run through some highlights. Uh, probably the most buzzed about guests this year at the fest. And there were a few that were really amazing. But Jeff Emmerich was there on Sunday. And he certainly attracted a lot of people. He did a talk on Sunday afternoon, which I went to. He was also signing things out in the hallway, which is where the guests sort of like line up. Uh, the special guests had their tables. I went downstairs on Sunday morning and he already had a line like a mile long. And it, it, it didn't let up till he left, obviously. But he was really great, I think, um, hearing him speak and hearing him. He sort of went through the process of some of the Beatles tracks and how they constructed certain songs and how he got the job, which is basically he applied for a job at EMI, didn't get hired, but then they later needed a recording engineer, approached the school he was going to, and he got hired and sort of just got put on the Beatles project. But a lot of people were a little bit annoyed with, with Jeff Emmerich. I mean, you can't please everybody, obviously. He has a reputation for kind of being revisionist Mm -hmm. when it comes to Beatles history. Um, I saw a quote that he must have said during the panel. I may have missed it or during his talk at the fest, which is the Beatles were the paint, but I was the painter. I think that's really far-fetched, obviously. That's that's a bit much. Yeah, exactly. I just, you know, and I, I get it, but... I personally approach everybody, like every single person ever, (laughs) with a grain of salt because, number one, so much time has elapsed. Nobody's going to remember everything, 100% how it it happened. Two, everybody's going to make their own part a little bit more grandiose than it was. That's just, I think, an ego thing that happens. I don't think, unless somebody kept like a meticulous diary that was written like an hour after everything happened, even that wouldn't be accurate. Um, right, which nobody does because so, they're in the middle of doing. They're not really re- reflecting yet. Especially for people who write memoirs and things like that. It's like, I know from friends who have written them or from other people I've talked to, you know, they do pull from like diaries and, you know, notes and, and newspaper clippings and that kind of thing. And and that's great, but it's never going to be 100% accurate. So that being said, it was great to have Jeff Emmerich there. I hope he comes back for the New York Fest just because I think he brought a lot of life to the fest. I think he brought a lot of excitement. To hear him talk about some of the tracks that were constructed, I mean, he started with Tomorrow Never Knows, which was, I think, his first track that he worked on for the Beatles. And um, to hear him talk about it, he played a large part in the the really complex sort of arrangement and how he brought things to John Lennon's attention as far as how to, you know, create some of the effects that were ultimately used on the track. If he did, if he didn't, whatever, it's in line with the actual provable history of the track. So, I mean, that works for me. It doesn't work for a lot of people who expect to hear the gospel truth out of everybody's mouths, which nobody ever should. PSA, take one thing away from this episode. Don't ever believe 100% of what anybody writes, even if they were there, even if they were in the room, whatever. It's like, it's never going to be 100% accurate. Exactly. One of the greatest things about Fest is that it does attract people like Jeff Emmerich. I mean, over the over the course of the time that at least I've been going to Fest, we've been able to meet some very interesting people who've been part of it. Like Mickey Dolenz was there one year and Peter Noon's been there. So, you know, people who were part of the Beatles circle at the time. George Harrison's sister Louise has been there. So you could sit and hear stories about her, her early days with George, Billy J. Kramer and, right. you know, other, he was there this year, you know, people who he were was. part of the, um, like the Brian Epstein roster of acts. There's really no limit to the guests. They've, I think pretty much anybody who's been associated with the Beatles has been there. Cynthia Lennon was there once. Patty Boyd was there. 
Yeah, I forgot about Patty Boy. I met her at the 2014 Fest. That was nice. cool. Um, she and Billy, um, Jay Kramer, and Vivek Tawari, who is the author of the Fifth Beatle graphic novel uh, based on the life of Brian Epstein, um, they did a panel. I th- think that was all that was on there was Vivek, Patty, and Billy, and they talked only about Brian. Oh, and it was cool. so lovely. It was so lovely. I loved that panel so much. It was like a packed house for that. The 2014 Fest in New York was one of my favorites because it coincided with the 50th anniversary of the Ed Sullivan show. So it was really busy. It was crazy busy. And oh, right. Didn't they go really to fun. Kennedy Airport and do some kind of reenactment they the did. day before? Yeah, they did. They did some viral sort of promoting. I did one of the days, which was just sort of like running around Manhattan with signs and things, which is really fun. I think they made a video, but I... I haven't seen the video in years, but, um, but yeah, they did go out to Kennedy airport on the day the Beatles landed to commemorate that, which was really cool. That's crazy. Yeah. This year, of course we have Billy J. Kramer there back again. He did an amazing set on, I believe Saturday and Sunday. I caught the Sunday set. Um, and he performed at the two closing shows on Saturday night, Sunday night. He is always a lovely, lovely guest, really funny guy, really cool with a lot of history, a lot of knowledge, obviously was around the Beatles, was managed by Brian, also, we had Jack Douglas. Jack Douglas was a huge draw. I unfortunately missed him. I had conflicts every time he had a talk. From what I understand, he was really great. He talked about producing John. And it's funny because people pointed to Jack Douglas and said, this is why Jeff Emmerich is full of shit because John chose to work with Jack Douglas and not Jeff Emmerich oh, like God. later. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Well, the one thing about every fandom is that there's always that contingent that just wants to go and argue. Yup. <laughs> And uh, this is no different. But yeah, so he talked about, you know, obviously he was involved with Double Fantasy as well. And even down to like some of John's last sessions. I believe he may have been at the Hit Factory the night, um, you know, John Lennon was killed because he was there working. I don't know that that's 100% true, but I I think that's true. Don't at me or do at me because I'm curious. And uh, two guests that are that were there in New York as well. Peter Asher, Jeremy Clyde. Peter obviously lost his partner, Gordon Waller. Gordon passed away a few years ago. Um, And Chad Stewart of Chad and Jeremy retired. So Peter and Jeremy were like, we're just going to get together, do each other's songs. And they've actually been doing a lot of other material as well. They incorporated an Ed Sheeran song into their set, which is really... Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, it keeps it really fresh. I think think the fest... Somebody put up a video of them doing it, and it's, it's really lovely. Um, actually, it may have been Christine Summer on her channel. Oh, on YouTube. nice. And then one of the really cool things that happened this year at the fest, it wasn't in the program, wasn't sort of anywhere, unless you sort of heard about it, was that Jeremy did a secret hotel room show on Saturday night. And it was amazing. Like, I, I went, and it was so intimate. He did only songs from his bottom drawer sessions, which oh, is his I series. Oh, I know, which is his, you know, his series of uh, solo albums he's been putting out in the past couple of years. And he did a couple of deep tracks from later Chad and Jeremy albums as well. He did some songs off The Ark and of Cabbage and Kings, which are amazing albums. Highly recommend them. It was a long show. He played for, I think, over an hour just in this little hotel room. And there were probably about maybe 50 people there, maybe not even, just all crammed in. And it was so much fun. Um and just a couple of the highlights, Jude Kessler, who has written now four volumes in her John Lennon biography series. I think she's only up to like 1966. I think this last volume covers 1964, maybe 65. I haven't had a chance to really dive into it yet. She's going through um, at least seven volumes, if not eight. And each one of these books is over a thousand pages. Jude Sutherland Kessler, check it out. It's called the John Lennon series. She writes historical narrative fiction. So she writes it as if it was a novel, but everything that she puts in there is footnoted and meticulously researched. So it's a dramatization, but it's a very close to history dramatization. And that makes it really easy to read too, because sometimes like books can feel, especially Beatle books can feel like a textbook, but this is like, you can picture what's happening. You can see like these amazing events. And yeah, she, her research is insane. Like she spends so long on these books and I don't, I admire her so much for her tenacity and her drive doing these because it's such a big undertaking. I think pretty soon we'll probably have June on as a guest. Definitely. I definitely have some stuff to talk to her about re John. I think we both do. Um, She is so knowledgeable. She actually also has a podcast with Lena Stagg, who is the author of, among other things, the Recipe Records series of cookbooks um, called She Said, She Said. So she launched her fourth volume called I Should Have Known Better. So she had a launch party for that, which was lovely. I was on two panels. The first one was 
I moderated, um, we like to call it our next gen panel, which is all about the experience of a second and third generation Beatles fan as opposed to the first generation. This is our panel. This is kind of one of our things. Yeah. I wrote an article for Rebeat about it, about the second and third generation fan experience. We like to talk about it. We like to showcase people in the community who are continuing the Beatles fandom and the Beatles legacy by making their own creations, you know, musicians, artists, writers, etc., because that is the future of the fandom. Absolutely. And this time was really cool because there were several, um, I've been saying young people. It makes me sound really old. I'm not that old, I swear to God. But uh, You can be very old and still be a baby in the Beatles world, though. It's true. (laughs) Exactly. It's a lovely thing. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I met a couple kids who were like 17. They came up to me after our Next Gen panel because we basically just went through, like Erica said, the experience of being a fan, uh, you know, a second, third generation fan. But we also touched on things like ageism in the fandom, especially since our panel, which was myself, uh, Kit O'Toole, who is this prolific writer. She actually also wrote my Michael Jackson FAQ, which is huge. And Sarah Schmidt, who is the uh, owner and operator of Meet the Beatles for Real. She's written a book about the Beatles. She's working on a new one. And Tina Kukla, who wrote a historical fiction sort of short story. And she's been active on in the Beatles internet fandom and community forever. So it was like the three of us sort of talking about our respective roles as writers and researchers and historians and sort of how that can create some friction with first generation fans who say, but how do you know this? You know, you weren't there. And which is the most annoying thing. I'm sorry. It's just, that's, that's ridiculous. And Kit had a great uh, comeback for that, which was if that were the case, nobody would write books about like Mozart anymore. Good point. I met a couple of people from Instagram. I, you know, was pretty humble because they followed me and they came up and said hello to me. And that was lovely. And talked to, yeah, some teenagers who would love to be on the panel in the future, which is awesome. We are always looking for young blood for the panel to talk about your experience because the, and I hope we have some young fans listening to us because your experience matters. Don't let the first generation fans tell you otherwise. We love the first gen fans. Yeah, we learn so much from them, but at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a much larger community than that. Absolutely. And speaking of the fans, so Sarah Schmidt, who I just mentioned, the owner operator of Meet the Beatles for Real, she is coming out with a new book. She wrote one book about the Beatles when they played in St. Louis, but she's coming out with a new book on um, the history of the Beatles fan clubs, Yay. which is so cool. Oh my gosh, her talk was great. She presented... Um, you know, if you were a fan, this is what you got, like the different chapters of the fan club and the the history of really like how the fan club sort of came to be and how it sort of divided up and how it fell apart, both in the US and the UK. It was really interesting. So I can't wait to read her new book. She's amazing. Definitely check out Meet the Beatles for real. It's so cool. Yeah. She collects all of these stories of people throughout the years who have met the Beatles or anybody in the Beatles inner circle and she just posts them on this gigantic she calls it a blog but it's this mega site and it's been even been cited by Mark Lewison and TuneIn he used her site for research which is insane she's a fountain of knowledge she knows so much about the fan life and collects these stories that you wouldn't get anywhere else because as much as historians love to know the sort of like minute details, but they they don't really go to the fans and talk to them that much. But she she loves that. And she's become a real like beacon in that community. She has agreed to be on this show. So we will be talking yes. to Sarah really soon. Finally, there's one more guest that uh, I'd like to bring up. And that is uh, Mr. Leslie Cavendish, ooh, who ooh. is who is the best. Uh, number one is the best. Um, he was the Beatles hairdresser. He met Paul in 66 when he was cutting hair at uh, Vidal Sassoon, which I'm sure that name sounds familiar to everybody, but Vidal Sassoon was really the cutting edge haha, mm. of that sort of swinging 60s Carnaby Street. They called it the geometric cut, which is sort of the bob, but it has bangs that sort of go at an angle over your face and instantly recognizable. That was Sassoon. They were really high-end. And so Leslie was part of that team. And he also, after he got associated with the Beatles, he started cutting Paul's hair via Jane and then moved on to cut the rest of the Beatles' hair, became part of their inner circle, was in Magical Mystery Tour. He was on the bus. Um, And then he he worked actually at Apple Tailoring as the hairdresser uh, at the very, very (laughs) short-lived Apple Tailoring Boutique. And he has a book out, uh, it's called The Cutting Edge, and it goes through not only his career with the Beatles in the 60s, but also his sort of experience in the 60s and swinging London, even through to Israel, which is where he spent the summer of love. And he talks about a lot of pivotal figures in the London scene. He really kind of 
knew everybody from his job at Sassoon's. It's a fun and interesting read from somebody who was there that doesn't probably get enough of a spotlight previously. So we are not going to talk about it this episode because we have plans for a Beatles book club that we're going to mm. be starting on the podcast. And then it's probably going to be one of our very first books. So yes. more to come on that later. But just as a teaser, if you want to be part of the Beatles book club and talk about this stuff with us, check out The Cutting Edge by Leslie Cavendish. Pick up a copy and start reading it because it's awesome. Yes. And you will be ahead of the curve because we yes. haven't announced it yet. And so this is our own little Easter egg today. Yeah. So Leslie, I interviewed him, I think back in June for an article on Rebeat. And he graciously agreed. I asked him, he, he said yes, that he would cut my hair at the fest. And I was so excited. Um, I told him, you know, he could do whatever he wanted with it. But, you know, the interest of time and because... It, you know, he was sort of set up in the hallway and, you know, he was doing these, uh, what they call symbolic haircuttings at the fest. And I wasn't super sure. I thought that meant he would snip a, like a little snippet off of somebody's hair and they got like a certificate that said they got their hair cut by the Beatles hairdresser, blah, 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 which is really cool. But I didn't realize the symbolic haircutting wasn't really haircutting. So I think I might have been the only person to get my hair cut by Leslie Cavendish at the fest. That is so amazing. And we have a picture. It's on our socials of yep, we have, yeah, her getting yeah. trimmed by Leslie Cavendish at the yes. fest. It's awesome. I know. I got a bang trim, which I also desperately needed. As Leslie was cutting my bangs, he was like, yeah, you needed this. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> I am aware, Leslie. That's why I asked you. <laughs> uh, but he is so cute. He is like one of the nicest people I've met at the fest really just like humble and like endearing he so loves being there so loves meeting the Beatles fans he will tell you himself he's just a fan the first time I met him in person we had emailed a bit before the New York Fest but the first time we really sat down and talked at the New York Fest on Saturday night we started talking about Arthur Alexander of all people if you don't know who that is really? we will definitely talk about Arthur Alexander in some future episode we have a great article on him on Rebeat which Leslie saw and he was really impressed by it and so we started talking about that so it was like a fast sort of music based friendship and he's just such a lovely warm wonderful person and I'm so grateful to him for my little haircut I want to tell everybody that I meet, like I go to Rite Aid, pick up my, my prescription. I want to be like, these bangs cut by the Beatles hairdresser, just FYI. I'm so <laughs> disappointed I had to miss this fest. It sounds like it was a great time. But they are coming back to the New York, New Jersey area in March. And I will definitely be at that one. So we have some of the audio of this interview that Allison did with Leslie Cavendish. And we're going to play you just a few highlights from here. The rest of the interview will be coming soon. And the written version is on Rebeat. But just to give you an idea of how cool he is and how sweet he is and how his story is so special because his telling of it is so personal, but it's also so wound up with the style and the culture of the 60s, which the Beatles were just one part of that. But that whole ethos just runs through every part of the Beatles story and he's focusing on it because that's where he sat. Exactly. Please enjoy these couple clips. We're going to, like Erica said, we'll make a broader announcement about Beatles Book Club and The Cutting Edge shortly. But uh, here's Leslie. I'm sure the first question people usually ask you is how you got the Beatles gig. But as you can say in the book, you almost didn't because of a soccer match. You know, there's three types of hairdressers. You've got the hairdresser. That's the guy that could do everything. You've got the hairstylist, is the guy that can style the hair, and you've got the hair cutter. And the guy that sort of towards the end of my, I was on to my sort of second year, Roger Thompson, he was Fidel's artistic director. In fact, he, he was the one that opened up the Sassoon shop in Madison Avenue when it first opened. He taught me a hair cutting. There was a great hair cutter. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was the slowest guy that you've ever met in your life. And we used <laughs> right. to have clients every half an hour so I can guarantee from we used to start at half past eight in the morning to the time he got to 10 o'clock, you know, he was running behind, behind, behind. And this eventuality of me washing hair and Jane Asher being one of the clients, I used to wash her hair and I used to hand dry it, which would take a long time. Mm -hmm. And then when I'd finished, I would go over and say, Roger, you know, I've just finished Jane, but it was always Miss Asher when I spoke to her. He'd come over and he'd just sort of say, hi, Jane, how are you? And he would touch her hair and do a little whatever he did, which was about five minutes worth. And he'd show her the back mirror and she'd go, thank you very much, Roger. It's lovely. 
really it was me that did it, but you know, he took the glory. Right. And it was his client, you know, it was his client. And then when I became a stylist, because he used to get so behind and she used to come in on a Saturday morning, and on three occasions he didn't do it. But I did it, because they would say, well, you know, the first time it was like, oh, if Roger can't do it, he would say, look, Leslie would do it. And it was okay, and then the second time, yeah, Leslie would do it. You know, if you're a good client, you, you do, you should actually look after your clients, and uh, you should have known better, to be honest with you. And um, <laughs> on the third occasion, the receptionist came over to me um, and said, look, Roger, again, can't do her hair. She's not very happy. Would you do it? And I had thinking, well, I haven't had any more clients, and I'll get myself organised to go to football in the afternoon. But I was just thinking it out loud. So she came over at about 11.30. She didn't say a word. And this time I got somebody to wash her hair, and then I blow-dried it, and then I trimmed it a little bit, just a fringe, took a tiny bit off. I did exactly what Roger would do, to be honest with you. So I wanted to say that, you know, she was... I'd cut her hair. And uh, showed her the back mirror, and that was fine. And I thought, that's it, lovely, OK, no problem. And when she turned around and said to me, what are you doing in the afternoon? I thought I knew what she meant, because she wouldn't have said, what are you doing in the afternoon? Mm -hmm. There's only one reason. But I didn't think about it, and I said, why? She said, would you have time to cut my boyfriend's hair? Now, you know who her boyfriend was. You just, you just knew it, but you never spoke about it, but mm -hmm. you knew who her boyfriend was. And that's when I said, nothing. <laughs> I said, you know, that's when I thought to myself, in my head I'm going, oh, blast it, can't go to football this afternoon, but never mind. She, and then she said, would you like to come over and cut your hair, what time suits you? And that is when I push my luck, when I said, so, you know, the game starts three o'clock, if I can get down there about, if I can leave half past two, that's when I said, is six o'clock okay? Thinking, I was, I was sort of tongue in cheek, oh, it's six o'clock okay, ha 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 ha. Uh, Spectre didn't say, well, actually, no, I thought maybe you could do it in the next hour or two, which I would have said yes. She said, no, that's fine, six o'clock, fine. So that was that. So I go to football, and all I'm doing is watching this game and knowing I'm going to go and cut Paul McCartney's hair. But when I eventually went round there, and after I cut his hair and we got on well and whatever, whatever, and I was asked to go again, the guy that really got upset was Roger Thompson. Because, right. you know, he right. was the peak best. Of hairdressing. I mean, he, yeah. you know, he was the artistic director of Adele Sassoon and he was the best, probably, hair cutter there was in the world at the time. And he could have also been the Beatles hairdresser. <laughs> so you obviously cut a lot of amazing people's hair, but one name I was really surprised to see pop up was Charles Manson. It's amazing how you're kind of in the, I don't even know if I want to say the right place at the right time, but you sort of weren't in the wrong place at the right time with that. I always say you're in the right place at the right time. The timing is always right. And as you put it, very, <laughs> very good way of putting that, in the wrong place at the right time. Yeah. Exactly, exactly what happened. Um, I remember it clearly, actually, because Sharon Tate used to be a client at Adele Sassoon. I never did her hair, but Sassoon used to do her hair. And so did Roman Polanski used to go, and he was friends with Adele. So I used to see them come into the salon, you know. When you see someone like Roman Polanski at the time, you know, mega film director, he's about five foot one, he's tiny. Right. And then you had Sharon Tate, you know, she's a five foot eleven, good looking, tall blonde. So, you know, she was noticeable. When this guy just rang me up one day in the salon down the King's Road and just said to me, no, oh, hi, he said, um, I think we've got something in common. So I said, oh, yeah, what's this? He said, uh, I'm a hairdresser, I cut a lot of hair in LA, you know, I cut the Beach Boys hair and, and I've done Sinatra and I've done this. And he threw all the big names at me. And I said, yeah, great. So he said, yeah, I understand you do the Beatles hair and blah, 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 blah. He said, and it would be a good thing. I'm, th I'm getting something together and maybe we could work together. It did sound actually a nice thing. But it was at the time where I was doing work at Apple at the time. I was very involved with the Beatles. I was around a lot and I was having a nice time. And I remember going to the studios, you know, and I didn't want to interrupt anything. And I said, yeah, I said, it sounds great. I said, look, can you give us a call in about three weeks' time when I've sort of got over what I'm doing and we can talk about it? And he said, yeah, it'd be great. You come and stay with us over, you know, in L.A. 
and it'd be lovely. And I said, yeah, it sounds absolutely great. And I said, his name? And I said, is that my name's Jay Sebring. Mm -hmm. And I went, okay, fine, no problem. So I just, you know, didn't write it down, but, you know, I don't come across a J many in England, and I don't come across a Sebring everywhere in England. Mm -hmm. um, and then this Charles Manson murders took over, which was terrible. The only thing I related to was, oh, my God, he's bloody well killed or knifed to death. Sharon Tate, who's bloody eight months pregnant, she was a, you know, I'm thinking to myself, what a beautiful looking girl. And then I read that was uh, done at Polanski's house, which he had rented from Terry Milton. Is that Doris Day, son? It is, yeah. Well, it was. He sadly passed away. Yeah, but yeah. Right. And, you know, I was invited to stay there. Then I see, strung up next to her, is her hairdresser, Jay Sebring. I'm uh. like, oh, my God, Father. This is the same guy that's rang me up. No one would have thought about Jay Sebring, you know. But to me, it was like, wow. You know, he, he asked me to come over there. And this is roughly about the same time. And I could have been hanging up there with him. Oh my Can you goodness. imagine? I know. And I, just, I never imagine. sort of told anyone because I, it was, I mean, you know, who's going to understand that? Or well, who's going to believe it? But I've never forgotten the name Jay Sebring. And when I saw it, also, when I was looking through my press cuttings and looking at the timings of things, and I was talking about Fidel cutting Mia Farrow's hair for Rosemary's baby, uh, when I was going through that, that sort of period, I was, you know, the Manson murders came up and this Jay Sebring always came to mind. And that's why I wrote about it, because it was, you know, here we was. And also the ridiculous thing is, they bloody write up Helter Skelter, mm. which was a Beatles song. Right. So what with that? And then the hairdressing thing and the whole thing was scary. And so, yeah, Charles Manson. Can you imagine me? Maybe you would have wanted a haircut. Jesus oh, my Christ. God. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, thank goodness, you know, that you were otherwise occupied, you know. Yes. We wouldn't have this interview, would we? No, we, wouldn't, we definitely wouldn't have. So that brings us to the end of episode three. But before we go, we'd love to give you our favorite Beatle-related thing of the week. Mine is going to be short and sweet because I just took you through it. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got to go with the Fest for Beatles fans in Chicago my favorite Beatle thing of the week, just the whole thing was really fun. And it was great to see friends that, you know, you only get to see twice a year. And, you know, my highlight of the fest, Avi, was my haircut from Leslie Cavendish. Thanks, Leslie, forever and ever. And the fest is, it's a crazy experience. If you have it never is. been to a fest and maybe never heard about it, look it up. And yeah. if you can get there, do it. Even if it's for just a day, you will never be surrounded by this many Beatles nerds in one time. So if you are crazy about the Beatles like we are, you will find your people. You will meet lifelong friends. You will be able to have personal conversations with people who were there when it all happened. You'll meet some new bright people in the next gen area, YouTube, you know, celebrities in the Beatles community mm -hmm. and, you know, writers and playwrights and historians and You'll just, you'll hear all of these things that you never thought you would. There's a marketplace with crazy amounts of rare stuff that you will not find anywhere else. So yeah, bring cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My one fest tip, bring cash. <laughs> definitely a please take all of my money situation. Everything Erica said. Yeah, absolutely. And if you can come to Chicago, that's my favorite fest. I love them both, but Chicago is my fave. So I'm obsessed with this thing this week that my fiance sent to me last week, and I can't stop thinking about it. There was this article was from a couple of years ago where <laughs> this man I can't it's it's crazy. <laughs> this man calling himself James Richards, he claimed that he visited another dimension where the Beatles existed, but never broke up. and his his new friend from the other dimension, um, explained to him the whole history of the Beatles and that basically it was all the same, though the cover of Sgt. Pepper was a little different, but the songs are the same. And then he also said that there is this 13th Beatles album that they called Everyday Chemistry. And James Richards was not supposed to take anything from the dimension, but right before he left, he did steal this cassette tape of this album, this album, Everyday Chemistry, um, <laughs> which is... Yeah. Okay, so... Quote, it's, use that term very light, loosely. Yeah. It, it's a mashup of Beatles solo projects with a little bit of new music. You know, if you had 
any hope, which of course I did, that maybe there was another dimension where the Beatles never broke up and, <laughs> and they were all still alive. Yes, it's great. It's it's definitely, you know, a mashup, but it's a great mashup. So that's what I'm saying. Like, I am obsessed with this, not because the story is ridiculous, but because the mashup itself is super, super, super awesome. I was reading his blog post about how he slipped through another dimension and I was like, I just, I, yeah, I just couldn't. Like, it's amazing. We'll definitely link it because it's, ugh, I can't, I just can't even deal with this. But you're right. His remixes are pretty good. His mashups are pretty good. I think that's what it's, I'm obsessed with, really, because you expect it to be absolute shit. And yeah. you get to the recording itself. And it's really good. And it, it kind of makes you think about how the Beatles were so good individually, but were just took it to the next level on their you know, when they were together and even their own solo songs mashed up together, it takes their catalog to a new level. And so I'm obsessed with it. That's my thing of the week. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And if you're a time traveler from another dimension, listening to this podcast, be sure to give us a rating and a review. So other Beatle maniacs in every dimension can find us. Um, you can find us anywhere you get your podcasts, wherever you're listening right now, Just search for BC the Beatles. Uh, be sure to also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Shoot us an email if you like, bcthebeatles at gmail.com. We're everywhere. We want to talk about the Beatles all the time. 24 hours a day, eight days a week. Days a week. 24 8. <laughs> Our new slogan as of last episode is actually, it's actually coming to fruition now. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Because the Beatles. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.